Namaste and welcome to Daily News Simplified, the what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we would be analyzing the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper of 11 June 2018. Now let us begin. Now we have taken this article from page 11. Now the reason this article is in the news, because the 18th summit of the Shanghai Cooperation Group was recently held in Qingdao, China. And this article provides the security perspective that has been agreed upon in the Qingdao Declaration. Now the members of the Shanghai Cooperation Group includes Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, India, Pakistan and China, wherein India and Pakistan were the latest members who became full members during the Astana summit of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in 2017. Now hopefully up till here you've understood as to why this article is in the news. Now let us understand as to what has been the security perspective that has been given in the recent King Dao Declaration. Now the first security perspective highlighted in the King Dao Declaration is that the eight members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization have reaffirmed the objective of RATS or what is known as the Regional Anti-Terrorist Structure. Now the three main objectives of the Regional Anti-Terrorist Structure is to fight against terrorism, separatism and extremism so as to ensure regional security. And in the King Dao Declaration, the eight members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization have reaffirmed these three objectives. Now the second security perspective given in the King Dao Declaration is the creation of a unified global counter-terrorism front under the United Nations. Now the creation of a unified global counter-terrorism front would be on the similar lines as the regional anti-terrorist structure, wherein France is a unified global counter-terrorism front which is under the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And the eight members of SCO want the creation of a similar unified global counter-terrorism front under the United Nations. Now the third security perspective that was actually missing from the King Dao Declaration was that it did not mention any terrorist groups. Now this has been seen as a drawback since India has been unable to include any Pakistan-based terrorist groups in the King Dao Declaration. And this differs from the Xiamen Declaration that was given under BRICS in 2017, which had mentioned terrorist groups that are based in Pakistan, such as Lashkar e Taiba, Jaish e Mohammed. And the declaration of these terrorist groups in Pakistan was actually opposed by Pakistan after the Xiamen Declaration came out. However, India has been unable to include these Pakistan based terrorist groups in the King Dao Declaration. And one of the reasons given for this is that Pakistan is a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, while Pakistan is not a member of the BRICS grouping. And therefore, India was able to convince the members of BRIC to indirectly include the Pakistan based terrorist groups. Now, the fourth security perspective in the King Dao Declaration is access to the database of the regional anti terrorist structure. Wherein India has become a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, it can access the database of the regional anti terrorist structure. Wherein RATS currently possesses information on over 100 terrorist organizations and more than 2,500 terrorists. And since India is now a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and of RATS, it can now access this database and thereby the information on these terrorist organizations and terrorists. Now the fifth point highlighted in the article with regards to the security perspective is the joint military exercise of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization called Peace Mission. Now this joint military exercise among the members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization would be held in Russia in 2018. And the significance of this military exercise is that it would be the first international platform after the United Nations where there would be joint military engagement between India and Pakistan. And because of this reason, the military exercise peace mission which would be held in Russia in 2018 becomes significant because it would be the first international platform after the United Nations for a joint military engagement between India and Pakistan. Now as you might know, India and Pakistan are not currently engaging in bilateral talks and the comprehensive bilateral dialogue that existed between India and Pakistan has been put on hold after the Uri attack. And moreover, both India and Pakistan are also not engaging under the platform of SARC. So therefore, the joint engagement between India and Pakistan under the Shanghai Cooperation Organization platform becomes relevant within the current context. Now, the sixth security perspective given in the King Dao Declaration is that the members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization intend for the global community to fulfill their requirements of the resolution of the United Nations Security Council to counter any form of financing of terrorism. Now the seventh security perspective given in the King Dao Declaration is that the eight members acknowledge the growing threat of returning foreign terrorists from West Asia. Now as you might know, various individuals from Russia, India, Pakistan and other members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and other countries 
went to specifically Syria and Iraq to fight for ISIS. However, after the defeat of ISIS, these foreign terrorists are returning from Iraq and Syria to their native countries. And within that context, the eight members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization have acknowledged the growing threat that are posed by the returning of these foreign terrorists from West Asia. But we have to wait and see as to what would be the on-ground initiatives that might be taken by the Shanghai Cooperation Organization to combat the threat that are posed by the returning of these foreign terrorists. Now the eighth and the final security perspective given in the King Dao Declaration and in the article is that the eight members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization want to draft an international framework wherein it would be a convention against the use of chemical and biological weapons by terrorist groups. Now currently the Biological Weapons Convention and the Chemical Weapons Convention already exist but these conventions are currently tailored towards the use of chemical and biological weapons by countries against each other. And what the members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization want is a convention against biological and chemical warfare that is more tailored towards its usage by terrorist groups. Now hopefully up till here you have understood the security perspective given in this article and in the King Dao Declaration. Now with regards to your UPSC slavers, now when you read an article in any newspaper, magazine or any other format, you have to understand that various articles would fall under the purview of two or more sections of your UPSC slavers. Within the security perspective given this article as part of the King Dao Declaration would be placed in GS Paper 2 in the International Relations section wherein the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the regional anti-terrorist structure can be placed in the subsection in important international institution, agencies or forum and in similar terms the Shanghai Cooperation Organization or the regional anti-terrorist structure can be placed in regional and global groupings or agreements involving India or affecting India's interests. Now in similar terms the security perspective given in this article would be placed in GS Paper 3 in the subsection Security wherein previously questions have been asked in your UPSC mains examination. Now this question was asked in GS Paper 3 in the year 2017 when which had asked what solutions do you suggest to curb the growing menace of terrorism to national security wherein you can refer to the India's access to the RATS database, India's attempt to include Pakistan based terrorist groups in declarations given by international organizations the creation of a unified counter-terrorism front under the United Nations and similarly you would be able to quote several of the security perspective that have been given in this section. Now while regards to GS Paper 2, questions on the Shanghai Cooperation Organization or the regional anti-terrorist structure have not been asked in the recent past in your UPSC mains examination. So what we'll do is to practice based on a previously asked question wherein the second question was asked in the GS Paper in the year 2012 which it asked to compare the significance of IPSA and BRICS in the context of India's multilateral diplomacy. So in the similar context, a question for you to practice, which would be to compare the significance of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and BRICS in the context of India's diplomatic efforts against international terrorism, when you can quote the various similarities and the differences between the King Dao Declaration of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Xiamen Declaration of BRICS. And so now with this, we move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from the editorial page on page 8. Now the focus of this article is that India should follow an open government data policy wherein government data means the information that the government of India has collected such as government budgets, healthcare measures, climate records, agriculture produce statistics and other forms of data that the government of India has collected over the years. And the author in this article has recommended that India should follow an open government data policy wherein this information that the government has collected over the years and this information collected by the government of India would be freely accessed by the general public. And the reason the author has recommended an open government data policy is that it would allow a data-driven governance architecture which can use artificial intelligence to solve social problems. Now hopefully up till here you understood the focus of this article wherein the author has recommended that India should follow an open government data policy wherein the government data means the information collected by the government of India over time such as budgetary information, agriculture produce statistics, climate records, wildlife records among other form of data that the government of India has collected over the years. And the author intends that this information or the data that has been collected by the government of India should be published for free access by the general public. And the reason the author recommends for an open government data policy is that it would allow a data driven governance architecture wherein it would use artificial intelligence to solve social problems. When the author has also given an example where data driven governance architecture can be used to solve social problems. When the author has given the example 
that if there is availability of data on the early produce of crops, soil data health cards, and the meteorological data, it can help companies to develop customized crop insurance solutions for the farmers. And in similar terms, if information or the data on literacy rates, the demographic data of a particular area, the density of educators, meaning the number of teachers that are available in a particular area, can help companies to develop customized solution for primary education in villages. So according to the author, if the general public has all of this information that are generally collected by the government of India, various companies, NGOs or research institutions can use this data to solve social problems. And therefore, an open government data policy would allow a data-driven governance architecture which can be used for citizens' welfare, creative innovations by companies, collective problem solving between the government of India and the general public, and lastly to improve accountability and transparency in governance in India. Now within this respect, the author has also given a five-point framework to form a data-driven governance architecture which will promote citizens' welfare, technology-driven creative solutions, collective problem solving between the government of India and the general public, and improve the transparency and accountability in governance in India. So now let us understand this five-point framework given by the author. Now the author has given a five-point framework to address the gaps in the execution of the open government data framework, wherein the first point given by the author is the government of India should ensure the completeness of the data stacks, which means let's say for example, the soil data cards that might be provided will have all the data on all the relevant aspects to automate data collection. And this data would be given by the government through a machine readable format or through a direct application program interface or APIs. Now the second point given by the author is that there should be comprehensive disclosure of data sets for their effective use. So it means that let's say for an example, a comprehensive agriculture data set would require the information that the government of India collects on soil, rainfall, crop production, as well as market rates. And there needs to be a comprehensive disclosure by the government of India on its various data so as to produce a comprehensive and an effective data stack. Now the third point given by the author is that clustering of relevant data sets and APIs. Now it means that there should be an interface between data sets which would then lead to creation of applications. So for example, an application of farm insurance would require data from weather, soil, crop cycle, sale data, market rates, agriculture sale data, among other forms of relevant data. So what is required is a clustering of various relevant data which would then help technology developers to have a proper roadmap. Now the fourth step given by the author is that there should be a building of anchor cases or basic case studies to encourage this form of data usage. Wherein the author has given the example of Aadhaar, wherein the application program interface for Aadhaar has led to the development of market applications such as Aadhaar enabled payment systems, Aadhaar enabled direct benefit transfer, and in similar form the author recommends there should be other anchor case or case studies that would encourage this form of data usage. Now the final step given by the author is that there should be a comprehensive governance framework that would have an open data council and have representation from the government of India and from the public. And this open data council would help in monitoring, regulating and the effective usage of the open data policy. So now hopefully up till here you've understood the five point framework given by the author so as to address the gaps in execution of the open government data framework. Now with regards to UPSC slavers, the data driven governance architecture based on the concept of open government data that has been highlighted by the author in this article would be placed in GS paper 2 within the section governance and in the subsection important aspects of governance, transparency and accountability, e-governance models and institutional and other measures of e-governance. And so now with this we move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from page 11 and what we'll do with regards to this article is understand the basic facts that have been highlighted with regards to the 11th World Hindi Conference and moreover, we will not delve into the political aspects that have been highlighted in this article. Now the 11th World Hindi Conference would be held in Mauritius in the month of August of 2018, wherein the main theme of the 11th World Hindi Conference is Vashvik Hindi or Bhartiya Sanskriti. Now this event is organized every three years by the Ministry of External Affairs, wherein the first World Hindi Conference was held in Nagpur in 1975. Now hopefully up till here you've understood as to why this article is in the news and moreover you also understand the basic facts related to the 11th World Hindi Conference. Now the understanding of these facts 
where the castles of the 11th World Hindi Conference are required to be known to understand the steps taken for the internationalization of the Hindi language and second as a means of cooperation between India and Mauritius. And so now with this, we move on to the next article. Now we have taken the lead editorial from page 8. Now before understanding as to what has been the focus of the author in this article, what we'll do is first understand the basic terms that have been given in this article such as the Monetary Policy Committee, Statutory Liquidity Ratio or SLR, Consumer Price Index, apart from other terms that have been given in this article. Now the understanding of these terms are necessary because editorials or articles within the economic section are very technical in nature and if you are not able to understand the basic terms that have been used in the article, it becomes difficult to comprehend as to what has been the views of the author. Now the first keyword given in the article is the Monetary Policy Committee now the Monetary Policy Committee is a committee under the Reserve Bank of India and it has six members with the RBI Governor who is the ex-official chairman of the Monetary Policy Committee. Now the main function of the Monetary Policy Committee is the fixing of the benchmark policy or what is known as the interest or the repo rate so as to contain inflation within the specified target limit. Now the second keyword used in the article is repo rate. And repo rate is the rate at which the Reserve Bank of India lends money to commercial banks. And this repo rate is also used by the Reserve Bank of India to control inflation. Now the third keyword used in the article is the statutory liquidity ratio or SLR. Now SLR is the ratio of the liabilities of the bank that the bank is required to maintain with the Reserve Bank of India. And the bank can maintain this in the form of cash, gold reserves or in the form of government approved securities. Now the SLR is also used by the Reserve Bank of India to control the credit given to banks and moreover to also control inflation. Now the fourth keyword given in this article is consumer price index. Now the consumer price index is used to measure the change in retail prices of goods and services which have been consumed by the population. Now the Reserve Bank of India uses the consumer price index to track inflation in the country which then the Reserve Bank of India uses to decide its interest rate. Now the fifth and the last keyword that you should understand which has been used in this article is multiple indicator. Now what used to happen is that RBI used incoming data on a whole host of factors such as inflation, GDP numbers, deficit indicators, foreign flows and the Reserve Bank of India used these various inputs to decide its rate and the Reserve Bank of India would assign different weights to each of these factors of inflation, of GDP numbers, foreign flows. Now these different weights would also fluctuate with time and therefore the market would often keep guessing as to what would be the rate set by the Reserve Bank of India. But now the Reserve Bank of India has implemented a new inflation targeting framework which only focuses on containing the consumer price index inflation and the implementation of the inflation targeting framework has reduced the flexibility of the Monetary Policy Committee and the Reserve Bank of India to respond in a dynamic manner to other market driven factors such as GDP numbers, deficit indicators, foreign flows among other factors. So now hopefully you have understood the basic terms that are being used in this article. So now let us understand as to what has been the focus of the author. Now what has happened recently is that the Monetary Policy Committee has hiked its repo rate by 25 basis point. And according to the author, this decision taken by the Monetary Policy Committee of hiking the repo rate has not surprised the market. And according to the author, the reason the markets were not surprised by the recent move is because they had anticipated that the Monetary Policy Committee would hike the repo rate. Now the author has given four reasons as to how the markets have been able to anticipate the hike in the repo rate by the Monetary Policy Committee. Now the first reason given by the author is that post demonetization, lot of individual companies deposited a large amount of money with the banks and post demonetization, banks were flush with funds and because of this the banks were able to park as much as 30% in SLR securities wherein the minimum requirement at that time was of 19.5% but the banks were able to park as much as 30% in SLR securities. But what has happened in 2018 is that the demand of credit is picking up and therefore the banks have gone slow in the purchase of government securities so that the banks can ensure that they can lend more money to the public. And because there has been a slowdown in the purchase of government securities, there has been a fall in the bond prices. And moreover, because of this, there has been an increase in the interest rate. Now the second reason given by the author is that there has been a rise in the global interest rate. Now what has happened that in developed countries, especially the United States, there has been a rise in their interest rates. And because of this, the foreign portfolio investors 
are withdrawing their money from the bond market in India and investing in the developed countries, especially the United States, because they are able to get better interest rate and higher returns in those countries, especially the United States. Now the third reason given by the author that the markets were able to anticipate the move by the Monetary Policy Committee is that there has been a rise in global oil prices and because of which the consumer price index inflation has increased. And in accordance with that trend, this prompted the Monetary Policy Committee to hike the interest rate. And because of the past trends of the Monetary Policy Committee of hiking the interest rate due to an increase in the CPI inflation, the markets were able to anticipate a hike in the repo rate. Now the fourth and the last reason given by the author is that deposits in bank have been slowing down but the demands for credit is actually going up. So the commercial banks in India had to hike the retail or bulk deposit rates so as to get new depositors. And because of this deposit rates hike by the banks, the market was able to anticipate that the Monetary Policy Committee would also hike its repo rate. So now hopefully up till here, you have also understood the four reasons given by the author through which the market was able to anticipate that the Monetary Policy Committee would hike the repo rate. Now the question is, is the anticipation of the market that the Monetary Policy Committee is going to hike the repo rate a problem with regards to the Indian economy? Now the author does consider it as a problem that the market is able to anticipate the repo rate hike of the Monetary Policy Committee because according to the author, the policy rates would then lose their benchmark status and thereby become less effective tools to control inflation or stimulate growth or to stabilize the Indian exchange rate. And to rectify this problem, the author has given two recommendations. Where the first recommendation given by the author is that the RBI should improve its forecasting skills, especially with regards to the impact of oil prices and of emerging inflation. And the second recommendation given by the author is that the Monetary Policy Committee should also consider going back to the multiple indicator approach. And according to the author, the Monetary Policy Committee should not primarily focus on the CPI inflation to decide its rate and thereby should move to the multiple indicator approach which uses a whole host of factors such as GDP growth rate, foreign flows, among other factors which become input for the Monetary Policy Committee to decide on rates. Now hopefully up till here you have also understood that the author considers the anticipation of the moves of the Monetary Policy Committee as a problem for the Indian economy because according to the author the policy rates would then lose their benchmark status and thereby become less effective tools to control inflation or stimulate growth or to stabilize the exchange rate. And to rectify this problem, the author has recommended that the Monetary Policy Committee should go back to the multiple indicator approach rather than just focusing on the CPI inflation to decide its rate. So now hopefully you have understood the focus of this article. And with regards to UPSC slavers, this article and this explanation given in this section would be placed in GS Paper 3 in the Economic Development section and more specifically in the subsection Indian Economy and Issues Relating to Planning and similarly in the subsection Government Budgeting. And so now with this, we move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from page 7. Now what this article provides is a criticism of the draft pesticide bill that has recently been released by the central government. Now the criticism given by the Indian pesticide manufacturer is that the proposed pesticides management bill will harm both farmers and the domestic pesticides industry wherein under this bill, it is not mandatory for the active ingredients of pesticides to be revealed in the registration process. Now, active ingredients are those chemicals in a pesticide product that kills, control or repels pests. But under this proposed pesticide management bill, manufacturers are not required to reveal their active ingredients of pesticides. Now, this has raised issues for Indian pesticide manufacturers. See, earlier what used to happen is when foreign pesticides manufacturer would register their pesticides in India would need to reveal their active ingredient and this would allow the Indian pesticide manufacturers to file a Me Too pesticides registration application. Now Me Too pesticide registration refers to a request to register a new pesticide product that is identical in its uses or formulation or is substantially similar to one or more products that are currently registered within India. So earlier, Indian manufacturers would file a Me Too registration on foreign pesticides by using the formulation of the active ingredients that the foreign pesticide manufacturers have, have revealed in their registration. Now because of the Me Too registration by Indian manufacturers, based on the active ingredients of the foreign pesticides, 
they were able to produce pesticides in India at a cheaper rate. But under this proposed pesticides management bill, the foreign pesticides manufacturers would not be required to reveal their active ingredients. And this would prevent the Indian manufacturers from replicating that formulation for Me Too registration. And this prevention of the Indian manufacturers for the Me Too registration would allow the foreign manufacturers to get total monopoly on the pesticides market in India. Now you have to understand that this news is currently in transition. And we have to wait and see on how the central government moves forward with the proposed pesticides management bill. And now with this we come to an end in the analysis of today's paper. Now we move on to the question for today. 